Inovação, segurança, programação, tecnologia, desenvolvimento. Começa aqui. DevSecOps. DevSecOps. O seu podcast de segurança em tecnologia. Hello everyone, how are you doing? It's a pleasure to start presenting our first episode in English because today you have an international guest. Actually, it's our second international guest because we had in the past someone from Peru, which was Carolina, uh, Carol actually. We talked about uh, container security, if you could remember. But today we have our first English uh, guest, so... That's why our episode is going to be in English. Sorry if you don't understand English. It's a good opportunity to start learning. But today <laughs> it's the episode number six of DevSecOps podcast, which is on our um, 9 February. I'm Cassio Pereira. I'm Mark Santos. And I'm Rodrigo Balbino. Awesome, awesome accent. <laughs> awesome, awesome accent of Rodrigo. Perfect, perfect, Rodrigo. Today we're going to talk uh, about an enterprise solution uh, special for helping developers to develop more uh, secure code, let's see, or develop securely, if I can see, if I can talk like that. And for that, we have, um, how, how can I classify this guest? He's an amazing guy which is, has some understanding of Portuguese. I know he knows how to say caipirinha, for example. <laughs> you follow and he, um pouco, um pouco. Yeah, <laughs> you see, you see, you see. And he will introduce uh, himself now, guys. Welcome, Jonathan. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for, uh, how to say, be able to join us and to discuss a bit, to help our listeners to understand about an enterprise tool, enterprise solution, also to understand the importance of uh, having secure tools during the development, during the, the pipeline and everything. So again, welcome and thank you. Please introduce yourself a bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Cassio. Um, yeah, so I'm Jonathan Davis and uh, I'm a solutions architect at Veracode. And so really I help um, a lot of the salespeople, but on the technical side. Um, so I help give demos of the solution, um, answer questions about the solution. Uh, and I also help uh, in the POC process and things like that. Um, so definitely really excited to talk um, with Casio and the team here about how um, developers can use these tools to write more secure code. Very good, Marcos. As you can see, he is doing the same job as you are at Nova 8, doing POCs, <laughs> performing demos. How you feel having a good partner today here with us? Marcos, uh, no, 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 to you. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm moving <laughs> the music, okay? <laughs> But, uh, I'm feeling good in working with you and Rodrigo in Nova 8. Um, The uh, the job is a good, I like uh, the the customers have so many questions. Stupid. Uh, uh, to yesterday, I, the customer make me a question. Mm -hmm. um, well, what which is better, uh, Sasha or Dust? Good question. Good question. No, no, but. Uh, <laughs> Is uh, is a different tools, uh, not the sure better one for yeah. They are different levels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good question. So it's yeah. not that um, one tool is better or one type of testing is better. It's that you have different types of testing for different use cases. Um, and so one of the things we do at Veracode is we offer a lot of different um, testing types. Uh, so we have um, SAST or static analysis um, to analyze like your first party code. Uh, we have SCA to analyze any third-party libraries you're pulling in um, because especially today in modern software, a big portion of the application is going to be using these third-party libraries uh, and we want to make sure that's secure. Uh, we also have dynamic analysis testing and so dynamic analysis testing will help us find vulnerabilities in running web applications. And so if you're just looking at uh, the code, you might not find certain issues that show up um, at runtime, things like server configuration issues. Uh, and so we can find those with dynamic analysis. And then we also have um, manual penetration testing. And so manual penetration testing is we'll actually have um, human beings test this application um, and kind of act like a, a red team 
um, to find uh, vulnerabilities that no automated tool can find, uh, things like business logic issues, for example. Um, Jonathan, this manual testing, can we call it as pen test? It's something yeah. like this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, manual penetration testing. Good. We, I worked with Fetacode in 2011 or 12, something like this, uh, in a company in Brazil called Serasa Experian. Really nice group, really big group and really nice company to work in. And back then, they were using uh, these um, three options, as you mentioned. SAST for analyzing our search code, mm -hmm. uh, DAST to, as dynamic testing, and also this manual testing when we called some uh, architecture or some, some guy, let's say some consulting. Mm -hmm. to help us with this manual test. Uh, I, and I have a question in addition to what Marcos mentioned. Um, how can how do how you approach customers to explain them? Okay, guys, you don't need it's not about being better or SAS or dust. Yeah. You have uh, you have to have you need to have these uh, levels of protection. How do right. you approach them? How do you approach the customers? Right. Well, mm -hmm. one of the things we have uh, is we have some helpful information on our website uh, that we can share with customers. Uh, and so one of the things that we share is the different types of flaws um, and which type of testing of uncovers which flaw. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking at that list, you can see that there are flaws that you can only find with static analysis. And then there are flaws that you can only find with dynamic. And so it makes sense to use uh, multiple types of testing uh, to make sure that you're uncovering everything. Okay, perfect. Rodrigo, question for you. To, let's, let's start using this perfect <laughs> English. <laughs> First of all, it's, uh, I have a warning. My English is a English proxy. And <laughs> I, I, I like to compare it uh, with Cassius face. It's a turbo. <laughs> yes, it's a so turbo. But it's a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> it's a work in progress. Uh, uh, as, uh, no, uh, ju I have a question. I have okay. a question for you. Just, ah, okay. just a question. Just, just a moment. Uh, how you uh, approach the customers? Because Jonathan said, okay, it's nice to have this. Uh, with a tool, you can find some flaws. With another tool, you can find different type of flaws. Uh, you use the same speech for customers in Brazil. Or you have some addition, some another information like, guys, you don't need this or that. You need both of them. Yeah, I, I like to, to say uh, about uh, more about the process. I, I want to understand how, how the process the, the user uh, usually. Uh, and I, I, I see how the gaps in, the, in this process. And okay. after all, I see how the gap is, and I'm just suggesting how to, to uh, have to Feel use these gaps. Yeah. Okay, yep, that makes okay. sense. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Now you can make your question. <laughs> now I, uh, I forget. I, my <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember. <laughs> I remember. Awesome. <laughs> what are the biggest challenges in selling security for, for oh, the biggest? Yeah. The biggest challenge, I think it's just um, education in general, um, you know, talking to people about the different testing types uh, and why they need them. Because a lot of times, you know, we're working with um, customers who are just getting started in their security program. And so we want to help educate them um, and make sure that they understand all the different options available to them uh, so that they can identify which gaps and, and which ones are most needed. Um, it's a good question because, for example, from security perspective, and I am uh, this uh, really security guy, let's say. So when customers ask me what kind of testing I need to have in my pipeline, I say all the kinds, <laughs> all kind of testing uh, that as you can pay or as you can implement because we have open source enterprise and everything. But of course, it's hard to to have this approach because it's SAS, DAST, uh, uh, SAS, DAST, SCA, IAS sometimes, uh, manual pen testing, uh, IAS. Uh, IAC, infrastructure as code, for example, containers, uh, servers. So it's a lot of uh, different lot. tests and different tools. And sometimes it's hard to customer decide what to do. So my, uh, how to say, my speech for them is at least you need to have SCA and SAST. Because with both of them, you're going to be, how to say, 100% covered on testing your code. So everything mm -hmm. you produce as, as software, which is your code, basically, it will be covered. As you mentioned, uh, Jonathan, a lot of modern softwares, they are using a lot of third-party softwares, mm -hmm. uh, which is libraries and everything. And we have some numbers against this. It's 70, uh, almost 70% of a software is composed by third-party libraries. Mm -hmm. So only, only 30% is your own code, let's see. 
let's say. With this, these two uh, combinations, SAST and SCA, it's a good approach to start uh, doing AppSec, let's say, application security. Yeah. Do you agree or have another opinion? Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, like you said, it's good to just start testing kind of your code, especially if you're thinking about it from a developer. And then you can kind of progress to some of the other types of testing. So I, I think that makes sense. Another thing that we do uh, to help developers is we allow um, them to integrate this product. Uh, and so they can integrate it, for example, into IDEs that they're using. Um, mm. And so if developers are using IDEs like Visual Studio, uh, Visual Studio Code, IntelliJ, while um, while they're writing code, they can also uh, be performing a security scan of that mm -hmm. code. Uh, and so that makes it a lot easier for the developers because they don't have to uh, necessarily log into our platform to kick off these scans and see the results. Uh, they can do it right as they're working. Um, and it's also going to make their life better because they're going to be finding these issues as they code instead of waiting until the end of a release, right? Because you don't want to be at the end of release on a Friday and then you find out you have, um, you know, 15 high severity issues that you need to fix, right? Uh, yeah. And so it's better if you can find these things as you go. I think I think this uh, kind of integrations is the, I don't know this word in English, but it's start of, state of art in mm -hmm. pushing left. Because it's... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all vulnerabilities in software is about coding. So... The, uh, let's say the vulnerability is burning uh, on the time and you already performed this kind of scan and you are already blocking this vulnerability even to burn, even to rise, let's say. I think it's the best approach of pushing left, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, pushing left uh, can be a gradual process too. So a lot of customers get intimidated, right? Because they're like, okay, uh, you have this product and you have all these different integrations. And so we're going to have to set up everything at once. But you can take a gradual approach. And so sometimes customers will start, and when they start, they're only doing scans in the Veracode platform. And then maybe after that, uh, they'll shift to uh, the kind of the CI CD. Um, and every time a build happens, like in Jenkins, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you're performing scans as well. And then you can do things like fail a job if you find high severity issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after that, you can shift left even further, like you said, uh, to, to kind of the, the, the um, furthest left you can go and actually do those scans in the IDE itself so that developers are catching those issues. And so, you know, one thing that we talk to customers about is that it doesn't have to be something that you do immediately, overnight. It can be a process of, of uh, implementing security. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Yeah. Rodrigo, you are when, inside to say something? Yeah, when you use this, this use this approach in shift left, you turn on the lights and the, the head of dev about the security and he he see it uh, with ten with uh, I don't know how how to do this but uh, say it in Portuguese. Você você liga a luz do do dev para ele sempre ficar pensando em desenvolvimento. Yeah, you give you, é you, say, you give a you give a hint for a dev to start uh, thinking about security at first. Yeah, let's say yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool, uh, cool. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I completely agree. And the developers, they're they're going to be happiest, um, you know, when they can see the results in the IDE. But you might not get to that state immediately. Perfect. It's perfect. Uh, Marcos, you have any question in your hands to to rise up or not? In this moment, no. <laughs> I think. <laughs> perfect. Marcos just uh, he just wake up. He still need to no, no. get. <laughs> It's not a problem. <laughs> and nice. you know, another thing too, since we're talking about how to help developers, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. up to this point, mm -hmm. we've talked about the different types of testing you can do, right? We talked about SAST, SEA, DAST. But then the other side of the equation is like, how can we help educate developers so they're writing more secure code, right? Because that's going to make your life easier because if all you're doing is testing for flaws and then fixing them, you're kind of playing a game of whack-a-mole. I don't know if, if, if you're, yeah, okay. So um, it, you, you want to make sure that you're actually introducing less flaws um, to begin with. And so that's where secure code training comes into play. Uh, and one of the, the neat things about what we do for secure code training at um, Veracode is that well, we don't just rely on videos. And so, um, you know, a lot of vendors will just show the developer a video and then give them a quiz at the end. But that's not really helping the knowledge stick. And so we actually have interactive training. Um, and so like, let's say you're learning about SQL injection, for example. Uh, we have these security labs, uh, which are hands-on. And so you can go into a course on SQL injection. We'll actually spin up a web application for you 
uh, that has SQL injection flaws. And so then you would get experience, um, first of all, practicing hacking those flaws. So you'd actually be able to um, hack a live web app. And then uh, we actually give you the, the code um, for that web application. So you can go in and rewrite those SQL queries so that it's no longer vulnerable to SQL injection. And so the developers get hands-on experience um, exploiting and fixing these things. Uh, and so that that's definitely um, also helps companies to integrate security because as the developers become more knowledgeable um, about secure code, uh, it's going to be a lot easier for you to um, to fix flaws in the future. And you're going to have less flaws to fix. Oh, good, I think, I no, think no, no. this is... Okay, okay, go on, go on. No, no, go, go. Oh, my uh, God. I asked, you, I asked you after. <laughs> I think this is the... How to say... Uh, main point in all software security because when we talk about this testing and mm -hmm. SAS and DAS and penetration testing all kind of security test is about to find problems and that's mm -hmm. uh, how to say that's a step on your process that you must have you need exactly. to find for problems all the time but you need to stop creating problems you exactly stop, you need to stop creating bugs and vulnerabilities and that's as you said this uh, kind of tool comes up because uh, if you don't come to the developer okay guy okay the, uh, my dev guy here's a SQL injection or um, cross-site scripting or whatever hip inspection or whatever and you need to fix this way <clears throat> okay mm -hmm. he will fix but Tomorrow he will produce new vulnerability. Exactly. If he don't, if he don't understand how to stop building code like that, as I as I call as defensive programming, it's kind of exactly like this. You need to stop uh, creating vulnerabilities. And for this, this kind of tools, as security labs, as uh, Jonathan mentioned, it's the best uh, approach to help the developer. Of course, of course, you have another tools and another approach to help other kind of people in this process as mm -hmm. system analysis or architects or mm -hmm. even DevOps guys or even business guys user, uh, and the end users. But for the developer, I think it's the best uh, way to educate. You know, to, yeah. okay, guys, here is how you stop coding shit as Rodrigo was doing <laughs> in the past. <laughs> <laughs> We talk about this in every episode. Huh? Uh, this, this culture is keyword. This keyword. Culture, yeah. Keyword. Yeah. <clears throat> Exactly. Yeah, and another thing too is that um, you know when we talk about helping the developer, we also have services in place. Um, and so you know one of the questions that um, some developers might have is, well, why should I even go um, with a tool like Veracode if there are um, free tools available? And uh, there are a lot of reasons, but one of the benefits is all the services and support that you get. So we actually have a team of people. Uh, they're called the Application Security Consultants. Uh, and they were developers in the past. So they have a lot of um, development knowledge and experience, uh, but they also have a lot of security knowledge. And um, a developers and security team members can actually um, book a call with one of these AppSec consultants uh, to ask them questions about the vulnerabilities that they found and how to fix them. So you can actually ask your questions uh, to a live expert uh, who can help resolve any doubts that you're having uh, and help guide you in the best ways to fix these issues. Uh, and, and so you do get a lot of services and support um, in addition to uh, the tools that we're giving you. This is this was supposed to be my next question, and it will it still will be. Oh. But uh, no, there's there's a, a comment on this when we, when it comes to SaaS solution, for example, when mm -hmm. we talk about uh, new companies, startups, and new business, they have a lot of different languages. I have mm -hmm. customers that they have Go, C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, uh, Python, mm -hmm. and some kind uh, some guys even using Clojure. Okay, so it's mm -hmm. seven, six, seven uh, different languages. And when mm -hmm. we talk about one specific language, maybe open source will help you. But mm -hmm. these enterprise companies, they have a lot of different languages. And that's why you need enterprise solution to have this mm -hmm. kind of support. Otherwise, you're going to have six different tools just for doing SAST for exactly. each language you are coding. So it doesn't make sense. But... Uh, maybe it's a trick question, Jonathan. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but wh when it comes to SCA, and mm -hmm. I, I know enterprise solutions, I know also open source solutions, what is exactly the difference between yeah. open source and enterprise? Because SCA, you just go to CVE database and get if there is there, you know. Something I'm, like I'm glad you asked me this question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
So uh, actually, we have a different approach to SCA. Um, so we do use the National Vulnerability Database as a starting point. Um, but the, the limitation of using just a National Vulnerability Database is that it's a claims-based organization. And so what that means is that somebody, um, you know, like a software developer, has to actually submit um, a flaw or a vulnerability uh, to the National Vulnerability Database. Then it goes into their backlog. And then they'll eventually publish it. Um, but what we do is, first of all, we do a lot of our own research. And so we're, we're using like machine learning and AI um, to monitor uh, popular third party repos on places like GitHub um, in order to find issues as they're raised before they're even reported to the National Vulnerability Database. And then we also have a team of researchers um, who can uh, dig deeper as well um, in, in kind of a manual way. Uh, and so we have a lot of our own research that we've done. And as a result, kind of the total uh, surface area of vulnerabilities that we can find in SCA um, is going to be about two and a half times the size of a vendor that is just relying on the National Vulnerability Database. Perfect. Now makes sense why, yeah. you, pay, why you pay for SCA if you have free solutions which can do something like the same, but not. Exactly. Uh, for example, in case of uh, last, uh, last biggest case was Log4j problem. Mm -hmm. And maybe these enterprise solutions on the same day, they were already uh, aware of this and publish and doing scans. And maybe some open source could take one day more. Let's say if it one day more or even more. And mm -hmm. this, from the security perspective, is being vulnerable, being exposed. Uh, one day, one hour more can cost your uh, company's life. Let's say it's a yeah. big risk, a big risk to take, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and in fact, there was a, another issue too, um, and it wasn't as big as the Law4j issue, but there was an issue um, with, I think, the UA parser JavaScript library, um, which is a really popular library that a lot of big companies are using. Uh, and so what happened was actually um, an attacker compromised um, the account of uh, the NPM account of the developer who develops this library, uh, which is downloaded millions of times. And this attacker uh, was able to um, inject malicious code um, so that every time you download it, you're downloading um, this malicious code issue. Um, and so um, almost as soon as that issue was raised, we were able to update our database and notify all of our customers about this problem. Uh, and so th that's one of the benefits that you're getting, as you mentioned, is just uh, the speed um, of updates that we can provide about uh, vulnerable third-party libraries. Perfect, perfect. Marcos, you are shy today. What's the problem? It's because of no, the English. No, uh, no, no, it's not a problem. But uh, I have a question, but you cut me <laughs> some minutes ago. Okay, I'm, so, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. but uh, I'm, I'm I have a new question. Um, okay. What's the biggest challenger you find in, in the customers, Jonathan? Uh, yeah, I think is that... Is it implement CICD? is uh, integrations, education, what's the biggest yeah. challenge? Yeah, I think that it's a couple things. Education, as you mentioned, um, making sure that they know about all the different testing types available to them um, and why they should use uh, different testing types. Um, and then the implementation can also be a challenge. And so that's why we recommend uh, doing the implementation in phases. And so uh, one of the things we, well, we really like to emphasize to customers is you don't have to do everything at once. You can take um, a crawl, walk, and run approach. Uh, and so, in the beginning, you know, may maybe all you do is you just upload your code into the Veracode platform, you know, once every week, and you scan it, right? And then after that, um, maybe you move over to Jenkins, and so that every time a Jenkins build happens, you're scanning code there. But maybe you don't even fail that build um, immediately if you find issues, because then the developers are going to get get angry, right? Because you're blocking their code from going. Uh, Cassio understands he was a developer, <laughs> and so yeah, then, yes. so and so so maybe you wait until the developers get used to having these code scans before you'll fail a build if you find any high severity issues, and then after that maybe you shift into the IDE so that developers can see these issues as they're coding, um, but it's it's a gradual process. Use the drug dealer yeah. approach, you know. Perfect, perfect comment. Perfect. Drug dealer. You give a bit, a bit, then you start yeah. rising. <laughs> oh my god. It's a good... Okay, question answered, Marcos. Are you happy now? Yeah, yes, I'm happy. I'm happy. Good. good. Awesome. Rodrigo, any questions to rise? Uh, I have a lot, you know. No, no, no. <laughs> I don't have. <laughs> okay. One, one more question, uh, Jonathan. 
uh, when you when you were talking about uh, SAS for uh, sorry mm-hmm. uh, SAS uh, static analysis, uh, mm-hmm. how Veracode approaches it's a, a software as a service solution or it's on premise solution? Yeah, uh, if it's both, what uh, what customers prefer? It's yeah. SaaS, cloud, or how it is? Yeah, I'm glad you asked this question. So we're a um, hundred percent um, cloud solution. So a hundred percent SaaS, um, and that gives us some benefits. And so one benefit is that you don't have to worry about scalability. And so if you're using an on-premise solution and you have a lot of applications that you want to scan, you have to make sure that you have enough uh, virtual machines and and uh, resources and infrastructure to support all the scans that you want to do. Um, but because we're a cloud solution um, built on top of AWS, you don't have to worry about these kinds of issues and we'll scale with you as you're scanning more applications. Um, another benefit that we get uh, by being a SaaS solution is we have the, um, all of this knowledge, um, you know, which customers uh, have shared with us by using the platform um, for over 15 years now. And so whenever customers uh, fix an issue or whenever they mark it, you know, as a false positive, that's data that our team is able to use uh, to make the tools smarter. And so over time, you know, our tools have gotten smarter. We've really cut down the number of false positives. We have uh, that false positive rate is only around 1% now across all the different applications that we're scanning. Uh, and, and so there, there are definitely a lot of benefits um, to being a, a, a cloud provider. This is a good, a good point, good topic, mm-hmm. because I've t- tested some other solutions in the past. And the percentage of uh, false positives in C++, for example, was 30%. Mm-hmm. Wow. But of course, other thing. languages like Java or C Sharp was 1%, 2%, which is really good. But anyway, uh, for C and C++, 30% is really much. And if you start, uh, let's say we get a company that we start security and they start doing scans and they start having 30% of their scans right. has fucking uh, false positives. The right. developers say, okay, you, you give me problem to fix, but it's not a problem. You give right, me another problem, exactly. it's not a problem. Then you, this is uh, even worse for, as Rodrigo was mentioned before, to focus on process and gaps. And this is even worse because developers, they are un- untouchable. Don't touch yeah. me, let me program. <laughs> they are this, this, uh, these superhero guys and they are not yeah. actually because they are building the vulnerabilities. <laughs> Developers, yeah. if you are listening to me, you are building the vulnerabilities. It's your fault, okay? It's not ours. <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, it's, this approach is not good for the process or for the future mindset, but uh, how to say, as you said, it needs to be step by step, first yeah. step first to, to have this future implemented. Exactly. Yeah. And like you said, it's so important to have that trust with the development team, right? Um, Because, you know, security and development need to be able to work together. And so that's one of the things that we want to do is we want to um, break down that barrier. And one of the ways you, you break that barrier is, as you mentioned, having a low false positive rate. Right. So so developers realize, oh, when the security guys give me an issue, it's a real issue. Right. And I actually need to it's actually something I need to fix. And they're not just going to send me on um, kind of a, a wild goose chase. Yeah, and uh, in addition, guys, talking to about this, we, I'm trying to get a new guest here for next episodes uh, to talk about a, a dynamic solution which uses AI and uh, artificial intelligence and everything to rise uh, new vulnerabilities with zero false positives. Let's see if you can have this talk with these guys from Israel. Let's see if they are coming up or not. If not, that's fine. If yes, that's fine. The same, nothing changing in our lives. Let's move on. Rodrigo, you have <laughs> something new to talk or something? No, I, I, I'm using Rodrigo. 100% to my brain to understand <laughs> the conversation. <laughs> to understand English. So I don't have time to uh, think about that. I have that. a question. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Also, I have a question to, to make. In, uh, about the... Um, the solution is, is on-premise or SEA. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, is there any difference um, in the solution on premise on in a cloud service? Uh, in, oh. uh, in in terms of fun- functionalities, functionalities uh, you, have, okay, okay. Yeah, you have more false positive one or other. Yeah. You have functions in in in, in cloud. You don't have in on premise. You yeah, so, a, so we're yeah. we're 100% cloud, yeah. um, and so every, every scan um, that a customer does with us, uh, they'll be doing um, within uh, Veracode's cloud. So there is no difference because you don't have yeah. on-prems. 
Yeah. yeah that's <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, if, if, I have... if you if you haven't listened to the the gas, you you don't have this. <laughs> you don't make this question. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I understand. <laughs> It's fine. It's fine because our mm-hmm. listeners is gonna need, is gonna uh, imp- start improving English. Start to listen also yeah. in English when you talk. And the most important, guys, it's not about to be native or have hundred percent clear English. It's about communication. We can communicate. We can understand each other. Even the guys who can speak good, but they can understand. And that is all about. And we, when you talk about uh, even security or developing or anything, uh, and it's big approach in Brazil that. People need to start learning English. They, you are already programming in English. There is no Portuguese program language. Uh, you are already using English. You are already um, using every day. You already play video games. So why not talk? Why not listen? Why not to improve or even produce content and everything? So we want also to encourage uh, people, our listeners, our community, to pursue English because it's not that hard. You know, we have contact with English since we were born on video games and everything, so it's not that hard. Okay. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and I'll keep improving my Portuguese, and maybe um, yeah. in six months uh, we can we can do this again in Portuguese. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Any, um, any use in uh, this moment? Um, uh, can you have uh, some communication problems with the Brazilian guys? Because our English is terrible, <laughs> and the potato <laughs> <No>. English. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, I've been yeah. able to, I think, uh, get all my points across and understand um, everybody here as well. So, yeah, oh, and good. and for this episode, we're gonna test this first transcription. So maybe we're yeah. gonna have all these uh, lyrics, how to say, yeah. transcripted mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. in English, so you can copy and paste and translate in Google, so you understand. Anyway, it's not a reason to not listen to this episode, but anyway, you have how many? 70 episodes on first and second mm. season. So you have a lot of episodes yeah. in Portuguese with Marco's yeah. jokes and everything, so you can come back there and <laughs> listen to all of them. Rodrigo, you were moving, you want to say something? No, I, I, I'm uh, just <laughs> listening. I'm, just <laughs> I'm, I'm using my brain to translate. <laughs> Don't bother me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's good. No, I have, I have a new question for Jonathan. Yeah, uh, do you have some, how to say, uh, Conflict, not you. I mean, uh, in process, some conflicts between developers and security when you raise some vulnerability for them, and they ah no, it's false positive. Oh, it's not a problem. Oh, this is actually it is a vulnerability, but I have Fido, I have web application Fido, I have mm-hmm. something and something and something to protect me. Mm-hmm. But because they don't want to fix this, they want mm-hmm. to avoid more job. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. We have these problems in Brazil. A lot of guys does this, and we yeah. say, okay, guys, uh, you need to fix this because if a hacker comes over your web application firewall, comes over your network, over you all, all over your other controls, it will mm-hmm. come to your uh, application. So you need to fix this anyway. You have this kind of conflict? Yeah, you know, um, we do, and we have a couple different ways uh, to kind of help customers. And so one of the things that we do is that we give the customers um, a choice. And so when we report flaws in the platform, uh, you know, we expect you to fix the code, but you have the option um, to market as mitigated in the platform. And so for exactly the reasons you mentioned, I could market as mitigated because um, I have a firewall or because of some other uh, control that I have in place, um, which I believe would prevent that from being exploited. And somebody on the team has a, who has a mitigation approver role uh, can then accept or reject that request. And so, um, you know, as, as a security person, uh, maybe as a developer, I can potentially go in, um, I can market as mitigated, I can leave a note explaining why I don't think we should have to fix it. And then uh, the person who's in charge of that program um, could choose to accept that. Uh, and so that's that's one solution. And then the other thing uh, c- kind of goes back to the AppSec consultants. And so the good thing is that you have these services, um, people like the application security consultants um, who can speak the same language as the developers. Um, and so if the developers um, are doubting, uh, you know, the security people, they can bring in an AppSec consultant um, who can explain in a lot more technical detail um, why this flaw uh, is truly going to be exploitable, uh, why it's an issue they should fix in code. Um, and, and so you have some options. You can fix things in the platform or you can um, c- consult with experts uh, if, if you want to go deeper with the developer. Good. Very good. This is very good, actually. Mm-hmm. Okay, Marcos, give us some message. You can do it in Portuguese because you didn't record <laughs> it yet. So that's fine. 
Ok, ok. <risos> Pessoal, <risos> vamos lá, para quem estiver escutando a gente na plataforma de áudio, por favor, compartilhe com o amiguinho, você está ajudando bastante aqui a gente, vai estar tá disseminando essa cultura, hoje em inglês, olha que legal. Quem estiver no YouTube, deixa o um comentário, clica no botão de like aí para ajudar e espalhar mais ainda, compartilhe também com o amiguinho, vai lá no seu Discord, Vai lá, logo no seu Discord bonitinho. Entra no canal lá, deve ser com a Podcast. E no Telegram, no canal do Cássio, por favor. Ele tá sempre divulgando informações bem úteis. E tá sempre colocando ali quando vai sair episódio. Tá sendo seis, é, teaser novo. Ele coloca informações diversas ali, que é bem importante. Vai alegrar Exatamente. bastante os nossos amiguinhos. Ah, eu sei. Ah. I don't understand everything in Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> if, if someone is listening to us and don't understand Portuguese, that's fine. We yeah. are asking for likes and money. Yeah. So you can yeah. send us money as a donation because we, we, we need to <laughs> rise this podcast over the world. So like, you can help us anyway. Like, share and money. That's it. Actually, it's followers. <laughs> I, I learned that in life, it's all about followers. I want followers. That's it. Follow yeah. me, guys. Follow me and I will be yeah, happy. Follow, follow Cassio. Yeah, you're right, because that follower is a repeat viewer, right? Yes, because Matt do you Mirror. remember the, in, the, I, I don't know if you watched Black Mirror, but there is this episode of they don't have money. It's just about uh, stars, five stars, mm -hmm. three stars or something. Yeah, I did see that. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's all about this. So I need to be five stars and that's it, guys. Like and <laughs> share and, <laughs> and everything. Oh. You'll be fine. Uh, Jonathan, uh, do you have any... Uh, how, how, actually, how can you talk about more of integrations? It's just about yeah. CI, CD, uh, as you said, IDEs, or you have some other kind of APIs or Jira to help uh, with vulnerability management management how is this integrations yeah yeah um, a great question so uh, like you mentioned we do have an api um and so in addition to um the integrations that we have with ci cd tools and ides um you can call our api directly um also as you mentioned we have um an integration with ticketing systems like jira um as well as um azure devops uh azure devops issues um and so you can for example with our jira plugin you can pull in issues from Veracode uh, uh, into your Jira, and then you can assign those issues um, to different developers and, uh, and team members there. Um, and, and so we do try to have a, a lot of integrations um, so that this tool will fit with um, a lot of the other things that you already have uh, in, in, as part of your process. That's great. great. Uh, I think yesterday, yesterday, no, last Friday, I raised a video on YouTube talking about uh, next-gen security. And I was mm -hmm. talking about something about, okay, imagine you could automate your mitigations. Like mm -hmm. you run a SAS scan and you found, okay, SQL injections, but you're going to take one month to fix this, but you need to mm -hmm. release tomorrow into production. So imagine if you could take these vulnerabilities and automatically uh, rise some rule in your web application file, Uh, firewall or even rise any uh, rule on your uh, API gateway, you know, some mm -hmm. kind of automation mitigations based on these vulnerabilities findings from SaaS, from SCA, whatever, uh, in order to anticipate this fixing, because it can take mm -hmm. longer time. But I was talking about kind of uh, next-gen sec security, as I called, but it's all about APIs. If mm -hmm. some tools don't offer APIs, you won't be able to do this. Or mm -hmm. you're going to have to run. Rodrigo is going to remember this because we work together in a company. We were using AutoEat. Remember this fucking robot, AutoEat? It <laughs> was clicking your, clicking on your screen and everything. It, it, was ter it can do everything, but it's terrible to program on this. And if mm -hmm. you have APIs, it's much easier doing Python or something, right, Rodrigo? <laughs> yeah, because this, this, this robot uh, save it about 10 million of, of year for a year uh, of this yeah. company mm. yeah. yeah interesting because because uh, the, just to clarify this robots was uh, it was open in a spreadsheet mm -hmm. and take some values and go mm -hmm. into some websites to input these values and click in a button because this website didn't provide apis hmm. so this this process was to refound it was a refound process all mm -hmm. this spreadsheet was refound for the company So only these robots, as Rodrigo mentioned, was saving for the, actually was getting back for the company, 10 million reais uh, annually. So, so just to have uh, an idea how automation has power in our life today. And when yeah, you talk probably. about automation and everything, it's the key 
uh, to have an API. And why I'm talking about this uh, deeply? Because a lot, actually, most of the open source tools, they don't have APIs. They, do, they can do good jobs. They can do good scans and everything. As I, OWASP has a lot of really good projects and, and, and so on. But some don't offer APIs. So maybe you have a maturity level of security that you need to do something extra. And without exactly. APIs, you, you are not able to do it. Yeah, 100% agree. Um, automation, as you mentioned, is really important um, and helps save time and money. And so that, that's also one of the reasons why we have uh, so many different ways um, to automate the tool. Yeah, awesome. Go, Rodrigo. You are muting and I'm muting. Uh, uh, talk, uh, okay. Talking about the, <laughs> the, the maturity level, uh, do you have uh, some, some approach to follow the, your customer to... Uh, to increase the, the maturity level in, in yeah, so, so, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So another thing that we have um, is we have analytics uh, and we have a lot of different analytics to help the customer understand, um, you know, kind of where they are in application security, right? It, it's like any other goal you'd set, right? Like, so if you set a goal um, that, you know, this year um, you, you want to become, you know, more fit, right? Well, then you're going to record um, what you're eating. You're going to record, um, you know, how many calories, you know, how many miles you're walking or running. And it's important to record these things um, and, and also your progress and fitness, right? So that you can make sure that you're actually moving towards the goal. And it's the same thing with application security. Uh, you want to have a lot of analytics in place so that you can make sure that you're actually making progress. And so we give you the ability to see the big picture. Of course, we give you reports for the apps that you scan, right? So if you scan an application, we'll tell you this application has vulnerabilities, but we'll also give you the bigger picture So you can see, for example, um, out of all the applications I've scanned, um, 70% of them are in compliance and 30% are out of compliance with the policies that I've set. And over the whole history of our application security program, this is how many issues of, you know, that we have which are not fixed. This is how many we fixed. This is how many days it takes us to fix an issue. And here's how all of that data is changing over time. Uh, and, and so, as you mentioned, uh, Rodrigo, we want to make sure that we give um, all of that uh, information and all of those analytics to the customer uh, so that they can see how their program is maturing. Now I'm sure, now I'm sure I'm Steve Jobs of application security because two, uh, because two or three episodes well, really? back, we talked about application security KPIs. And comes Jonathan with this yeah. information. So I'm Steve Jobs of application security. And now I'm sure I'm going to be rich with this. Oh. I have a, uh, an important question to, to make to Jonathan. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the biggest um, difference in, in, in use SASH in Brazil and in SCA? With the maturity level, uh, when Rodrigo says, is, yeah. more, is, is best in USA, is, is uh, higher than Brazil? What's the difference? Yeah. Um, so I can't uh, speak too much to like how different regions are using, um, you know, these different tools. Uh, you know, probably somebody on, on our, um, our channel team could better answer that question. Um, but I, I would say uh, kind of back to Cassio's earlier point um, that I think it's important to have SAS and SEA in place uh, because uh, Cassio, I think you gave that statistic, 70% of an application is um, open source, right? Or we're pulling our third party libraries. Um, and so if you're just scanning uh, your first party code, then you know, you're leaving 70%, right? Uh, of your application unscanned. And, and so I think it's really important to use both. Um, we make it easy for you to use both. Uh, and so when you do a static scan, um, we're automatically going to do an SEA scan if you provide us with um, your dependency manager file. So for example, if you're using Node.js, if you provide us that package lock.json file along with um, you know, the Node.js code you want us to scan, we'll do static analysis and SEA at the same time for you. And uh, in addition to this question of Marcus, actually trying to give an, some answer, here in Europe, we are more uh, proactive. You know, Brazil is still reactive. So we still mm -hmm. wait for vulnerability. We still wait for something to happen to inv make investments and everything. I think it's in the US is kind of like Europe, kind of proactive and companies. They have more uh, regula regulations, more uh, something about this. So maybe they are pushed to do something, uh, not to wait to the problems, but to approach the problems before they happen. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, guys, we are on the time. 
So I want to say thank you to oh. Jonathan to, for thank joining you. us. <laughs> Be, before saying goodbye, Marcos, I need to ask you permission because mm. Rodrigo today has a joke for us <laughs> on our episode. Oh, okay. he, was, he was working one month on this uh, English joke. Oh, okay. So okay. let's let's see what comes up every okay. episode, Jonathan. We have a joke, you know, kind of joke yeah. to see if you understand. But let's see. Let's see what Rodrigo okay, brings us. Rodrigo. This joke is for, for Jonathan, okay? Okay. <laughs> what does a baby computer car, uh, call you's father? Oh, what? How? Data. <laughs> oh, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually pretty good. It's <laughs> Marcos. <laughs> I have to I like say, it. every day this this podcast is growing and growing. Now we are we have even international jokes, you see, and the, the, the guests <laughs> laugh on this, so it worked. It's funny, perfect. yeah, it's perfect. Okay, guys, Jonathan, thank you again. Thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us. Thank yeah, you thank you so much. Knowledge. Thank you about uh, talking about Veracode. I know a lot of companies in Brazil they are using, and we are. Um, I'm an enterprise guy. How to say so. Uh, I push companies to come to this enterprise approach, not on, not only open source. I think open source is first level. We need to go to second level and third level and automation and everything. So thank you for coming up with all yeah. ideas and all clarifiers, okay? Yeah, thank you guys. And um, Rodrigo, Marcos, uh, muito prazer. Muito prazer. Ah, <laughs> muito prazer. Oh, muito prazer. <laughs> perfect. So this is the episode number six of third season. And I'm Cassio Pereira. I'm Marcos Santos. <laughs> Rodrigo Balbino and, and? Jonathan Davis. Oh, Perfect, yeah. guys. So see you <laughs> next week on next episode. Bye bye. Bye bye. Termina aqui. Deve Secops. Deve Secops. O seu podcast de segurança em tecnologia.